Hi guys, welcome back. This is going to be our next video in our little series. We got asked by a couple of our viewers if we could cover the Carnarvon and the FV4005 as well as the FV215. And incidentally all these vehicles are connected so we thought we'd make one large video covering all three vehicles. So hopefully you'll enjoy this and on to the video. The origins of the FV215 began in 1949 to 1950 as a result of the IS-3 tank first seen at the end of World War II. The Allies at the Berlin Victory Parade got their first true glimpse of the new Soviet tanks and were alarmed by the IS-3. In this machine they saw a large gun, well-sloped armour and a good turn of speed and the fact that several observed let them know that such machines were now in full production. The Allies believed this tank, in hindsight somewhat erroneously, to be the primary armoured threat of the Soviet Union. The notion that they had nothing to take on such a machine, of course, is garbage. The Allies had plenty of weapons, both in service and in development, that they felt would be effective, but nothing at the time mounted on a tank that they could be certain of. The current Allied tanks, such as the M4 Sherman and Comet, were not going to cut the mustard. And while Centurion was already being considered for the 20 pounder gun in 1945, this was some way from production. Thus the Allies went down the route of mirroring, a method of approach that is heaped scorned on them from some current circles. But using hindsight to judge the past is fruitless. Thus to counter a heavy tank, they felt they would need their own heavy tanks, a reactionary move known as mirroring. In all honesty, the T-54 and its ilk were the greater threat, but the Allied forces reacted to what they could see before them and not what they didn't know about. Thus, the US began the process that led to the M103 heavy tank. The French worked on the AMX-50, while the UK began work on the FV214 Conqueror. But how did we get to this point? The UK had, from 1942 onwards, been working towards two projects. These were the Heavy Cruiser Centurion by the Department of Tank Design and later the A45 Universal Tank. It's often written that the Centurion was the first universal tank, but this was never the case. The A45 was. Montgomery had argued, along with others, that the idea of splitting tanks into classes for different roles, notably infantry and cruiser tanks, was flawed. In North Africa he saw that while the Churchill tanks could withstand punishment, they were too slow to follow up on any successes, while the fast cruisers were unable to make the breakouts due to the weak armour. What was required, he felt, was a capital tank, a vehicle with the aspects of both having good mobility, protection and firepower. Montgomery, however, was met with resistance not only from the old school influencers such as Fuller, but also from the war office itself. And, while ideas win wars, there also has to be a technological ability and willingness to produce such concepts. Thus his dream of seeing a universal tank, as it became known, would not come about until the end of the war in the form of the A45. Outwardly, this machine appeared to be very similar to Centurion, However, she was somewhat longer, marginally better protected, and had a power takeoff unit, which Centurion did not, as well as built-in adaptability for a variety of purposes and a different suspension system consisting of a series of small road wheels. It even later mounted the Centurion Mark II turret. A41 Centurion and A45 would continue to progress, although the War Office at one point felt they would phase the Centurion out by about 1947 to 1949. Post-war, the UK removed the old A names and applied a new FV series ranging from FV100 to FV900 originally, with each subsequent number representing a vehicle or role within that class. A45 thus became FV200, with the FV201 as the gun tank version, while A41 Centurion would later be retrofitted with the name FV4007. FV-201 would, for all its early promises, go on to cause problems in other places. It was too wide for the landing ships of the time, which would require a whole new class of landing ship to be built, something Centurion didn't have to worry about. Thus the UK had an issue. Their new tank, which had absorbed so much of the budget, offered very little that Centurion herself could not do. Both mounted the same guns, and both could be used as flamethrowers and so forth, and both could be upgunned yet Centurion was faster and cheaper to build. FV-201's future was even less certain after a tripartite tank meeting in 1949. In this meeting, the US insisted that tanks would be split into three distinct roles which aligned with their idea of tank doctrine. These would be light tanks armed with 76mm guns, medium tanks armed with 90mm guns, and heavy tanks armed with 120mm guns. 
At 10am on the 14th of April 1949, her fate was sealed. The UK held its meeting at the Adelphi Hotel, London, and in these minutes they agreed to standardise the heavy tank armament along with the US and to base it on the new 120mm gun being developed for the T-43 heavy tank. Major General Pip Roberts argued that it might be better to just do away with the FB-200 family and fit the 120mm gun into Centurion, thus having a good all-round tank capable of both roles. However, a Mr. A.P. Wickens from the Fighting Vehicle Design Establishment and later the Chief Engineer at Fort Halstead replied that this would add too much weight to Centurion and require the engine from the FV-201, as well as extensive rebuild costs. This argument went back and forth. A further chief engineer, Mr. A.E. Masters, then opted to mount the Centurion Mark III turret on the FV-201 with a 20-pounder as the new medium tank, and that Centurion Mark III should be phased out of service by 1952, and that if FV-214 were not ready by March 1952, then these vehicles should fill the gap. The gun choice was formally agreed on the 22nd of June 1949. This spelt the end of the FV-201 in its current form, and it was decided that the FV-201 would be converted into tank, heavy number one, 120mm gun, Conqueror. And while that was being developed, the 17-pounder FV-221 Carnarvon Mark I and the 20-pounder armed FV-221 Carnarvon Mark II which would act as stopgap vehicles to evaluate and test the hulls while the new turret and American T-53 120mm gun were being tested. Later on the 27th of June 1949, the director of the Royal Armoured Corps asked for authority to begin working on three tanks. These would be Heavy Tank FV-214, Heavy Tank FV-Z and a Medium Tank FV-Ys. FVY, the letter Y, being a stand-in filler for now to what would be a new medium gun tank with a new gun capable of piercing all types of armour, while the FV-Z would be a heavy tank mounting a super heavy gun. There was some confusion between authorities on these matters. Some at the time felt that the FV-Y would be a medium gun tank with a shared commonality with the US guns, while others felt it should be an indigenous design. The FV-Z, however, was clearer, as the super heavy gun would need to defeat 6 inches of armour at 2,000 yards, angled at 60 degrees, which it felt the US 120mm gun could not do at the time. Meanwhile, the FV-221 Carnarvon was also causing its own issues. It was agreed that it was only an interim vehicle, as the hull was also to be used for the FV-214, but the turret was not ready which incidentally led to them testing the 120mm gun on the Centurion as the FV-4004 Conway. Meanwhile, the turret from the Centurion Mark III would go onto the hull to test it out and provide an intra-medium tank. The notion to make the FV-221 Carnarvon as a standard medium tank was not liked, as it was twice as much as the Centurion Mark III to produce and offered no advantages. Carnarvon would go into production, with the first three made by Vickers Ellswick, with the first mild steel prototype being delivered in July 1952 and a further armoured steel prototype being delivered in June 1953 under the name Medium Tank No. 1. Carnarvon would be tested in Germany and Libya extensively to get a better feel for how they handled over a variety of terrain. Interestingly, the name Carnarvon also drew an official letter of complaint to Her Majesty's Government from the town clerk of Carnarvon who was offended that the vehicle had been spelt using the English method and not the Welsh name, and that they had not even been asked if this was OK. Meanwhile, work on what would become the FV215 had already been underway. Four projects were under consideration. There was a large debate at the time as to whether to use missiles or a conventional gun. The missile version would use a mixture of a UK missile and the Project J missile, originally a French and Australian idea which later became an Anglo-Australian project and led to the development of the super heavy missile destroyer FV-4010 and the missile became the Malkara missile armed with a 58 pound Hesch warhead. The other three ideas were all gun based vehicles. The gun idea caused more problems as the US gun was not felt capable of meeting the requirements. In reality it was but bad intelligence had massively overestimated the arm of the IS-3 tank. Major General Stuart B. Rawlings, then Director General of Artillery, surmised that there was no such gun currently available with the capacity, and while the UK was aware of work going on in the US 155mm tank guns, 
looked at its own special brand of ammunition, Hesh rounds, which had been developed during the early Second World War for anti-armour work. It was always anti-armour first with Hesh rounds and a useful demolition secondary effect, contrary to certain videos, and it most certainly was not designed after the war. The gun program led to two areas. In spring of 1950, the project was passed to the School of Tank Technology under the name Project Minotaur. Here, they were to design a vehicle with a 180mm gun, given the code name Lily White for the project, aligned with either a meteorite or gas turbine engine, also under code names. The vehicle could either be casemated, turreted, or external, and after some six months and a lot of calculations, they concluded that the most appropriate layout would be a rear turreted tank with 20 road wheels in 10 pairs and a crew of five. The first official investigations outside of the School of Tank Technology into a 180mm gun mounting had been officially ordered by the 9th of November after a preliminary investigation by Morris Motors, around the same time as Minotaur began. In January 1951, the government issued a requirement for a 180mm gun on a Centurion chassis for a limited or all-round reverse sub-propelled gun with splinter-proof armour, which it was hoped would be introduced by December 1952. This would go on to become the FV4005. The second request was for a limited traverse gun with heavy frontal armour on the FV200 chassis. A preliminary report proposing the outline of the new vehicle was done by Vickers Armstrong on the 23rd of July 1951, which would go on to become the FV215, which it was hoped for could be ready for the middle of 1953. However, it wasn't until the 1st of April 1954 that the design specification was ready, and in June 1954, an order was placed for the prototype to be built by Vickers Ellswick. Further refinement of the design was undertaken by the FVRDE between the 25th of August 1954 and September of the same year, with the order increased to two vehicles. One armoured prototype and one firing trials vehicle were placed in September 1955 at Vickers Ellswick. As to the naming issue, there was already a vehicle with the name FV215, an AVRE concept, so this was given the affix FV215B and the gun tank simply known as FV215. The FV215B, contrary to certain computer games, was never a tank design. Work was already underway on a full-size wooden mock-up based on the FV200 chassis idea, now known as Tank Heavy No. 2, 183mm FV215. Rather than create a new gun from scratch, the designers chose to use a 7.2 inch heavy field gun, reworked into a tank gun, with a bore evacuator added. This new tank gun was named the Ordnance Quick Firing 183mm Tank L4 gun, and it was to fire the L1 183mm Hesh round, weighing in just shy of 200 pounds. No armour piercing or heat shell were ever made for the gun as they would not have been effective and limited the one useful round the vehicle carried. FV215 came in at 61 tonnes and was a heavily armoured behemoth of a vehicle. Three drawings were made by Vickers and although lost to time they were recorded as a front mounted, centre mounted and rear mounted layout with a fully rotating turret. The last of these was chosen as it provided the best overall balance and travel arrangement. The tank was to have a five-man crew, with the commander and the turret left, the gunner to his right, two loaders in the rear, and the driver situated to the front, with the engine located amidship. The horseman suspension carried over from the FV214. The large turret was originally quite boxy in design, with welded plates and a large hatch to the rear, possibly for open firing, however this disappeared on the full-size wooden mock-up. The large turret was on a 2.4 metre turret ring, and the armour was some 254mm of well sloped and angled plate, which would have been cast to the front and welded in places. The L4 gun itself weighed some 10 tonnes complete, with 7 degrees of gun depression and 15 degrees of elevation. Contrary to popular computer games, the weapon could fire in a 360 degree angle around the tank, although this was not advised when on an angle or slope due to stability issues. Meanwhile, work was also being carried out on the FV4005, now known as Centaur. In December of 1952, Vickers noted that the design and manufacturing for equipment for mounting the 180mm gun on the Centaur had been done, and that trials had been carried out at Ridsdale Gun Testing Site, and certain modifications to the design were found necessary. 
In June 1953, they wrote in their accounts that the first of two tanks had been delivered to Woolwich and work on two more were proceeding. In September 1953, they recorded that design and manufacture of equipment for mounting the 180mm gun onto the Centurion FV4005 No. 1 tank was complete and awaiting transport, and that the second tank was still awaiting for the gun mounting from the Royal Ordnance Factory Woolwich. These were followed by firing trials against static targets which took part alongside the Malkara missiles and other equipment. The targets were a mix of hard targets, including Centurion tanks with burster plates, the first Centurion tank, P1, and a Conqueror with burster plates, often mistakenly called Super Conqueror. The trials proved very successful. The burster plates made no difference at all, and on the Conqueror tank, both hits caused huge amounts of scabbing inside and left both the hull and turret cracked open. On the Centurion P1, the first shot was simply low, buckling the hull and ripping off half the running gear. The second shot which struck the turret blew it clean off the tank. The first of the vehicles tested was known as FV4005 Stage 1. This was primarily a gun test rig to work out the weapon and so forth. The weapon itself differed from the later model and had a concentric recoil system rather than hydraulic recuperators, which caused some problems and was later fixed to a limited arc to the front of the tank. Unfortunately, and as commonly touted, she did not have an autoloader of any type. The ammunition was very heavy and so it was stored in a two-part system of round and charge. The rounds were kept in a drum-type magazine that could be turned to align them with a loading tray for ease of loading and the cases were in a second rack to the left hand side. It was a loader assistance of some sorts, but not an autoloader. A small foldable rail system could be placed across the back decks to help resupply the vehicle, as passing the large rounds up there was always a risk of dropping them, and so each was loaded onto a small rail and then pushed towards the magazines. The second and possibly third Vic were known as simply Stage 2. This had a 14mm barn-like turret stuck on top, with structural braces in place. The vehicle was designed to engage from a range in which return fire was unlikely, and as the hull could only effectively carry around a 50 tonne range, more armour was simply not practical. The loading mechanism was a much simpler affair, and the gun now had conventional hydraulic recuperators. The vehicles went through various tests, but with technology increasing it soon became apparent that such machines were simply not needed. While their destructive power was fearsome, they were large, heavy and costly, and the same effects could be carried out with a well-placed anti-tank guided missile. Initially, Malkara used on the Humber Hornet and later weapons like Swingfire from a greater range and were, and were considerably cheaper. Today, only one vehicle remains, where it has been kept outside at the Bovington Tank Museum and is now starting to show a lot of corrosion in places. The vehicle remains not a monument to any important design or technological aspect, but rather to highlight an era where designers built and developed ideas to counter perceived problems in the dark ages of uncertainty. Well guys, I hope you like this little quick talk on the FV215-4005 and a bit on Carnarvon. Uh, if you did like it, um, give us a like and subscribe and hit that notification button and all that uh, doohickory. And uh, leave us any suggestions below for anything you want me to research. And until next time, toodle pip.